Story continued from Pelicana Mimus episode. It is midday over the marshlands that will one day be Spain. Though with heavy cloud cover, it is difficult to tell what time of day it is. Between the trees and above the foliage, a strange sail can be seen occasionally breaking through the leaves and branches. The signature display structure of a medium-sized predator, Concavenator. Stepping out from the constrictive plants, the full body of the carnivore is revealed. Just under five meters long, he isn't fully grown, but already has the quills on his forearms and neck that derive maturity. This is the male that only a few hours ago failed in his attack on a Pelicana Mimus flock after they retreated into a river to escape him. Now getting quite hungry, the subadult male is under great pressure to feed himself and it needs to be soon. In the foliage surrounding him, a flock of concornists spring from branch to branch, also looking for food, though they are after much smaller morsels. The 300 kilogram theropod below watches them scamper all around, darting wildly in all directions. Too fast for him to catch. Even to attempt would likely burn more energy than they were worth, so he moves on. Being the wet season, the water levels have risen greatly, and much of the lowland areas have become quite boggy. The concavenator sticks to more solid ground, as trekking through the mud or saturated soil isn't just more difficult, but can potentially be dangerous if he sinks and gets trapped. In the more open regions, he sees a herd of Mantellosaurus grazing. Adults weigh up to three quarters of a ton, so too large for him but maybe when he is older, they will be viable prey. Not wanting to risk going after even the youngest members of this herd, the irritated predator heads towards a nearby river where he has caught prey in the past. As he walks, the rain starts up again, but he is used to getting saturated, and experience has taught him that wind and rain can be advantageous in a hunt. The sound of Eva often being louder than his footsteps and concealing his approach. Eventually he nears the river and sees a familiar sight. Another flock of Pelicanomimus are foraging along the riverside. Some search on the bank while others wade through the shallow water, the occasional chirp sounding from each one as heads bob up and down checking for danger. Slightly ahead of the flock is a number of Europe Jara, small pterosaurs with two meter wingspans Though standing, they don't even reach a meat at all. They are also foraging, though it's clear they prefer to do so alone, without the noisy Pelicana Mimus encroaching on them. The young concavenator watches in anticipation, keen to have another shot at hunting one of the lean dinosaurs. When it comes to Pelicana Mimus, only one in ten attempts ends in a kill, as they are incredibly fast and have excellent eyesight, so just getting close enough to strike in the first place is difficult. Despite his hunger, the predator remains patient. They haven't spotted him yet. He just has to wait till an opportunity arrives and be quick enough to take advantage of it. The minutes go by. The rain continues to fall lightly, and while the predator remains still, his targets steadily move along the riverbank their constant checks providing no openings. Eventually, the Europe Jara have had enough of this area, and one launches itself into the air, causing the rest of them to follow suit, and in a few seconds, all of them are flying away. The movement and noise of the departing pterosaurs draws the attention of the Pelicanomimus group, their heads snapping to the flying reptiles, nearly all eyes on them. The concavenator saw his chance and took it, lowering his head and breaking into a sprint, cutting through leaves and vines that blocked his path. He ran at the nearest Pelicanomimus, but the rain wasn't heavy enough to completely muffle his charge, and multiple heads turned in his direction as he closed in. Almost in unison, the long-necked Ornithomimids darted to the river and began throwing themselves into it, sinking below the surface. It was happening again. He may have been closer now, but still his prey was too fast and was too close to the water. The concavenator didn't give up, he kept after the closest Pelicanomimus. If only he could just grab one with his jaws. 
in the river where the first Pelicanomimus had gone below water. Suddenly, there was splashing in all directions, and a thick, scaly tail broke the water's surface. The Pelicanomimus' head shot out and screeched in shock before being pulled back down, and the same scaly tail thrashed again. A crocodilian had caught the unfortunate omnivore by the leg and was pulling her to the bottom of the river. Other Pelicanomimus turned around, desperate to get out of the water, while those on land jinxed to run along the sandy bank. But for the one that had the concavenator right behind him, he couldn't change his course fast enough, and the sharp teeth of the predator bit into his tail. The concavenator wrenched his head backwards, throwing his prey to the ground. The victim tried to right himself, but slipped on the saturated dirt, so was helpless as the young concavenator stepped up and sunk his teeth into its neck. Without hesitation, the carnivore shook his head from side to side, and the Pelicanomimus's neck broke in multiple places. The hunt was over. The rest of the flock ran in all directions, and in the water, the panicked female Pelicanomimus was still struggling, trying to keep her head above water, as the unseen crocodilian ripped her down. The hungry concavenator ignored the commotion, and instantly started to feed. His thin, serrated, blade-like teeth easily cutting through his prey's flesh. Soon, he would finally be sated. In the bushes, a tiny crocodilomorph, Bernice Artia, watches on having seen the whole event. At 60 centimeters long, he usually feeds on insects and small mammals, but the carcass of a Pelicanomimus is a massive bounty. He just had to wait till the concavenator had eaten his fill. And no matter how hungry he was, he'd never be able to pick it down to the bone in one sitting. The little croc would have to be quick though. No doubt plenty of other scavengers would find this kill in due time. The river was a busy area for all sorts of animals. Hello fellow travelers and welcome back. Today we will be breaking down a theropod with one of the oddest spines I've ever seen. Concavenator, also pronounced concavenator. The first and only remains of concavenator were discovered in the Cueca province of Spain. This holotype was nearly 100% complete, and so well preserved even skin impressions remained. In 2010, it was named concavenator corcovatus, the genus name meaning hunter from Cuenca, a reference to the province it was found while the species name being a reference to the hump-like structure on its back. The specimen was found in the La Huaguena formation, dating to the Beremian age of the early Cretaceous between 125 and 121 million years ago. It was found to be a Cacarodontosaur. Specifically, it was an early diverging member of the more basal Cacarodontosauridae. So in the same family as Giganotosaurus, Mapusaurus, an Acrocanthosaurus, but more closely related to species like Luso Veneta from Portugal. Based on the holotype, Conca Veneta grew to between 5 and 6 meters in length, stood between 1.2 and 1.7 meters high at the hip, and weighed between 320 and 400 kilograms, making it a medium sized theropod, but on the smaller scale for Cacarodontosaurs. In many ways, Concavenator is built much like other members of its family, of similar size. Looking at a skull, we can see it has the typical Cacarodontosaur shape, with fenestra in front and behind the orbits to reduce weight. The nasal and lacrimal bones rise to create crest-like structures that end just over the eyes, either as a display structure, but also potentially as natural sunblockers, aka sunglasses. The teeth were thin, laterally compressed, serrated and slightly curved. The arms ended in three fingers with claws, and even preserved what are believed to be quill knobs on the forearm, but we'll cover those in detail later. Then we get to the back, and the two vertebrae before the hip that are far taller than the others, creating a tall, narrow, crest-like sail. This has led to many theories on the use of such a structure, as it has in the past for numerous dinosaurs, with similar plates or sails, from stegosaurs to spinosaurs. One theory was thermoregulation. It could have turned the flat side of the sail towards the sun to heat up, and away from the sun to cool down, 
This is highly unlikely, given that the surface area is very small to begin with, and theropods were more likely endothermic, so could produce their own body heat. The most agreed upon theory is that it was a display structure, used to show health, size and maturity to potential mates or rivals. It may have been more brightly coloured compared to the rest of the body, or capable of changing colour. Perhaps it was used in conjunction with the crests on the skull as well. Another argument has been that the sail played a part in fat storage, which has come from the observation that behind the hip, the vertebra are raised, but not to the same extent as the ones that make up the sail. It's believed that between these two, there may have been some sort of soft tissue structure linking them, or that the space between there was where fat could be stored. It's not a bad hypothesis, but there's no direct evidence that Conca Veneta deposited fat there. So for now, the most agreed upon theory is that it was a sail used for display. On a quick note, some have asked, are the vertebra right behind the two sail vertebra damaged or crushed in any way, as they do appear quite low. But according to the science team that worked on it, there doesn't appear to be any sign that the bones suffered from any form of pathology. They were simply just built like that. Now let's move on to the forearms. As we can see, running along the ulna are a series of bumps on the bone, which have been theorized to be quill knobs. Quill knobs are created by ligaments which attach to the feathers follicle, and indicate that the feathers or quills that attach to these points are quite large. However, it's not certain that these are quill knobs, as in 2015 it was pointed out that the bumps were on the anterior lateral side of the ulna, where those structures rarely form in any species, and it's more likely that they were attachment points for muscles or ligaments. In 2018, another study found that the ulna was preserved in lateral view. This means that the ulna bumps were positioned posterior laterally, instead of anterior laterally. Plus, the bone had suffered from fractures and abrasion, shifting position around and making it harder to identify exactly where the structures were on the ulna. What this means is that it's far less likely these were muscle or ligament attachment points, and lines up slightly better as quill knobs, as originally thought. Now, does this mean that Conca Veneta had feathers on its forearms, or anywhere on its body for that matter? Well, it's likely it didn't have flight feathers, the kind you think of that modern birds have. Instead, they were possibly just simply quills, which are modified scales. It's common to see Conca Veneta depicted with these, and we know other dinosaurs had them, such as the very well-researched Cetacosaurus. It may also had some form of downy feathers for insulation, though this is more likely when the animal was young. We do know that some parts of the body were definitely covered in scales, as we have skin impressions from both the foot and the underside of the tail. The bottom of the feet have small polygonal scales, while the top has larger rectangular scales in the form of scutes. Basically, it had scales almost identical to many modern birds, here is a close-up of an emu's foot for reference. But while the foot was very bird-like, the scales on the tail were quite reptilian, having three scales for each row, one for each vertebra, making it somewhat comparable to snake scales. The more bird-like features from the foot scales to potential feathers were quite unusual to find on Conga Veneta, as at the time, no evidence had been found for this in its entire clade, that being Carnosauria. It was previously thought that only those in Sorlilosauria had feathers, so this discovery really threw some through a loop. Since then, other species in Carnosauria have been found to have feathers, and additionally some ornithopods as well, which has led to the current theory that feathery integument is ancestral to dinosaurs. That's right, they had them from day one basically overtaking the previous theory that they evolved feathers later in certain groups. In fact, they may be ancestral to Avimetatarsalia, which is the group that includes dinosaurs and pterosaurs, as pterosaurs are also known to have feathery coverings, sometimes called pygnophytes. Some of the species Concavenator lived alongside include Pelicanomimus, an Ornithomimosaur, Mantellosaurus, an Iguanodontid, Europagyra, 
a tappy jarred pterosaur, Concornus, a toothed bird, Monsacasuchus, and Bernisa tea, two of multiple crocodilomorphs found in this formation. So as we can see, Concavenator has been extremely important in expanding the understanding of dinosaur evolution and adaptation. Because of this single well-preserved skeleton, it has unlocked so much more information about the clade as a whole, not just naming a single genus. Its unique appearance has made it easily recognisable by paleo fans worldwide. It deserves far more attention, and is a testament to the hard-working scientists that uncovered and studied it. But what do you think of Concavenator? And for my question of the week, the only other theropod we have that has a sail anything like this is Altispinax, so do you think this form of small sail on the back may have been more common than we think, we just haven't found the fossils yet? What well, lesser known dinosaur would you like me to do a breakdown on next? And until then, please like, share, subscribe, and wait for one final bit of commentary. Okay, so I was thinking about how Concavenator's sail was polar opposite to Ichthyovenator's, but someone beat me to the punch and made this. Also, someone commented saying Concavenator sounds like a name given by Dr. Doofenshmirtz. So without further ado... If I had a nickel for every time a medium-sized theropod evolved a small sail with a few extended vertebrae, I'd have two nickels. Which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened twice.